see you. Um, I'm Rachel. I currently work for Action for Children as the interim HR director, but I also do some work for Talis as a team coach as well. But I'm actually here today to talk to you about a time of my life, which I'm very, very happy about, when I worked for Royal Sun Alliance, actually just down the road at Leaden Hall before they moved to the big fancy building. Um, and I'm talking really about how by understanding the whole of the person and connecting the personal profiles with the individual, you can genuinely create a shift in performance, productivity and culture as well. So, you know, as we go through today, I'm here to tell you a little bit of a story um, because I hate boring presentations. So it's just going to be a little bit of a, um, a sort of a, a guide for you as we go through. And this is a point where I wish I had a dress on, where I had pockets in or trousers because I usually like to put my hands in my pockets to stop messing around. So, we'll go forward. Okay, so the story. What's the story? So, Royal Sun Alliance, as you know, probably about 10 years ago, maybe 11 now, went through a really um, low point in terms of performance and profitability. Andy Hayes came into the organisation as the CEO and turned that around. I joined them in around 2012. Um, and at that time, we had some really great employees, but there were some key things that were broken. So, our engagement was high. Um, but our service was actually quite poor. So what did that mean? It meant that we had a 50% of our new starters leaving within the first 18 months, which was costing us well over £200,000 a year. Our net promoter score, if hopefully you all know what that means, was the lowest it had been in three years. So in terms of providing brilliant service, which is what Royal Sun Alliance aspired to do, they were not doing that. And we had 100% of managers disengaged with the recruitment process. So from our perspective, actually, we had some really tangible things there in terms of drivers as to how do we go about recruiting the right type of people to do these roles. So just to give you the context, you all know more than insurance? Yeah? Okay. So we have a call centre in Peterborough and we have our claims handlers, we have our technical claims handlers, we have our sales people, and we have our service people. And they were our frontline people that we were really looking at because that's where we win business but equally we also lose business as well. So when we talk about something like net promoter score being the lowest in three years, how did we know that? Well, apart from the data, the feedback also told us that our salespeople were failing to build rapport and empathy. They were overcomplicating the policies and the processes, um, and they were being highly inaccurate in the data that they were actually taking from the customer that then went back out to the customer to check. So the customer always had to ring back in. So there were three things, for example, where actually we were definitely not performing. 50% of new starters leaving in the first 18 months. You know, that's a huge cost to any business, not just in terms of time and energy and advertising costs. It's also about the impact that it has on the people in the teams in a culture where you're trying to create a sense of brilliant service. And then managers being disengaged with our process. Well, of course, you know, recruitment takes time. So it was taking four hours a day, two to three days a week to recruit frontline roles. Um, and this was taking way too much time out of the business for our, our managers. And equally, the processes that they were going through, the conversion rates were very poor, um, and they were questioning, actually, is this really adding any value? Okay, so in terms of moving forward then, I wanted to take you from, I suppose, um, the tagline to the hook because I think that it's nice to tell you the story, but you want to know what the outcome is. So the outcomes were that we returned 75% of time to managers through a better recruitment process, which I'll share with you a little bit more later. We moved our net promoter score to green, so more than 80% of our customers became satisfied. We had a reduced attrition rate by 50%, and 80% of candidates met the profile. So in terms of delivering tangible financial results to an organisation, we were able to show that by completing this piece of work. But of course there's the intangible piece as well. So the real true measure, and I'd like you probably just to think about this as we go through, of recruiting the right people who have the right type of personality to do these jobs is that they shift the culture. And as you start to bring in more people who are more suited to do these roles, the culture shifts in the direction that you want it to do in terms of providing brilliant service to customers, but also creating a really positive environment to work in. So, in terms of the thinking and the theory that we applied, so we worked with an organisation called Chemistry, who's run by Roger Philby and his team. Um, and we'll talk about you know, how the approach really helped us to identify the right type of person. We wanted to consider the whole of the individual. 
So there's been quite a lot of work done, probably in the last two to three years, and quite a few books written, about moving away from just considering the qualifications and experience of an individual. Because what does that really bring? You know, there's more to us now than a certificate, you know, having gone to the right university, having, you know, done the right graduate programme. What, what does that really give? But equally, you know, there's experience as well. You know, and have people got the right experience? Uh, but we wanted to consider, well, actually, if we are recruiting somebody, and let's be honest, to sit on a phone for eight hours a day selling a policy, what type of person do they really need to be Apart from liking being on the phone, um, you know, what else do they really like to do? Do they like to talk to people? Do they like to be open? Do they like to be jovial? You know, what are their values? What are the things that drive them and motivate them to want to come to work and sit on a phone for eight hours a day? Because I don't know if any of you have done it. I've done it. Um, and I can honestly say I could not do it full time because I'm just not that sort of person. So I'm a different whole person. Then we thought about connecting individual motivations to business needs. So this is where we started to think about what are the drivers of individuals. Um, and part of that was about what were our motivations in terms of our career anchors. So I know that this is basic stuff for a lot of you, but actually, you know, for somebody who wants to sit on a phone every day, what drives them in terms of do they need to be entrepreneurial, do they need security, do they need challenge, you know, do they need a certain lifestyle, what is it that aligns them to go actually I like that job, I'm going to apply for that job because it suits my needs. And how do we make sure that that's aligned to where we need to be as a business as well. Then we wanted to make sure that whatever profiles we developed were cognizant with what good looks like. And this is really interesting actually because the approach we took this to this and I'll come to this is taking a perspective of the whole of the process, so people who were good, bad and indifferent at the jobs that we were recruiting for, uh, whether they had done the jobs, whether they had been considering doing the jobs, um, and actually having a profile where we knew if we got those two things right to begin with, then what were the results that they could produce at the end of the day? Yeah? We wanted to create an assessment where we had a greater than 80% suitability match. So this comes back to our conversion rates. We didn't want to be spending unnecessary time recruiting people who genuinely were not suited to the job. It's a waste of management time, it's a waste of HR time, it's a waste of agency, and the cost, financial cost, was significant. And then we wanted to make sure we had some measurable, tangible impacts that we could show to the business as well as, obviously, for us having intangible impacts as well. So we created some KPIs which would help us to do that. So in terms of how we went about doing this, so this is probably a little bit more of the detail. We, as I said, work with a company called Chemistry um, and we decided that qualifications and experience were only a very small predictor of success, which is genuinely 25%. So there's been some scientific research on this that indicates if you recruit on the whole of the person, based on this five box models of values, motivations, behaviours, experience and intellect, actually you're increasing your predictor of success by up to 75%. Does that surprise anybody in the room? No? It's quite interesting really because chemistry had worked with a number of organisations, O2, Vodafone, BT to name but a few, that had done this type of process in many different ways that had actually shown tangible impacts and results by recruiting on the whole of the person. Now intellect is the hardest thing in the world to change, so that's something that you develop very, very young and usually by the time you're around seven, I understand, your intellect is very much determined. Values um, you generally get from your parents. Um, and your experience as a child. And again, up to the age of seven, things like fears, phobias, um, traits are, are actually starting to be built within you. Um, motivations are slightly different. They're easier to change because, of course, your motivations in terms of what you aspire for in life might be different. So you might meet the perfect partner, you might have an opportunity to go and work in Canada, um, you might be able to go and do some volunteering, and so therefore your motivations might change depending on your circumstances. And that's where we look at career anchors, um, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Your behaviours obviously change. So, you know, every experience that you have, and even this experience for myself right now, I'm thinking, my goodness, what am I saying? What do I look like? Am I moving my hands too much? <laughs> um, you know, I'll reflect back on this, and based on whatever feedback people give me, I'm certainly not going to watch the tape, um, you know, because that's the worst thing in the world to do, um, and think, okay, what could I do differently next time? So how will my behaviour change next time? And then that's, again, based on very much on experience. 
In terms of the first step though, we looked at career anchors and what we established for our two main core roles in terms of sales and claims was that it was lifestyle and security that drove our people. And how do we do this? So we talked to people who apply for jobs but didn't get it, we talked to people who got the jobs, we talked to people who had been in the jobs, we talked to people who had wanted the job in the past but then moved into a different role. So we actually had a very broad spectrum of input from, um, from the individuals to identify what really drove them. So let me give you an example. We had somebody in our team who had very high entrepreneurial spirit. Um, six months in, she was just amazing. She was rocking every KPI, she was getting brilliant feedback, she was just the star of the future. And I'm not kidding you, six months and one day she fell right to the bottom of the pile because her level of interest, her level of creativity, her level of empowerment, her level of being able to be innovative just stopped because there was no more to be done. So she would bought everything she could possibly bring in that first six months and then that was it. So that clearly showed us, that's just one example of many by the way, that actually bringing somebody into a role where you are going to sit on the phone for eight hours a day talking to customers who will tell you everything by the way, and I'm pretty sure you probably all do this too. You know, my mum made me a cup of tea, my wife's sitting on the sofa telling me I should be doing X, Y, or Z. You know, my friend had the same issue with his door, his ceiling, so why can't I have the same? It's amazing what we tell people. And um, it's fascinating. If you ever get a chance to sit on a call centre phone, do, because it's quite interesting if you haven't done it. But it really showed us that that type of person who was entrepreneurial, creative, who needed challenge and drive and motivation, just was not the right person for this job. So in terms of career anchors, that was something we really identified was that lifestyle and security were the main drivers. And you know the thing about that was this was part of what really made that person tick. So then we looked at behaviours and attitude. Um, and this is very much the core of who we are as individuals, the core of you. So the heart was really about having somebody who wanted to create empathy. The, <coughs> the building blocks of, of you as an individual in terms of what makes you tick is also about having confidence, so having the confidence to stand up and talk today, having the confidence to deal with an angry customer, having the confidence to sell something to anybody. Um, you know, you've got to have that within you and that belief um, to be able to build that within yourself, but build morale within others. And then there's something about making it happen. So, you know, these people were all achievement orientated people. So, I was having a conversation with Susie earlier about StrengthsFinder, um, and we didn't use StrengthsFinder in this situation, but actually, what we did do was identify people who needed to tick that box. You know, people who needed to go, oh, I've made 10 sales today, or I've processed 10 claims today, I've made X amount of money, and I've dealt with that in the times that I've been allocated. Um, and by the way, it, it wasn't like a, an Amazon where we monitor everybody's every second of every day. Obviously, we have targets and we have, you know, um, movement boards to make sure we understand how people are performing. But ultimately, you know, there is a sense of freedom there for them to be able to make the decisions they need to, to give the right service. And then it was also about improving performance. So it's about measuring that performance as well. But actually the, under, the underpinning element of this was we wanted people who genuinely wanted to provide brilliant service. So you can call it what you like, but if you meet anybody from RSA and you talk to them about brilliant service, this, this is what is the core of the brilliant service approach within more than. Um, and it was about people who genuinely wanted to help and support customers get the right deal and deal with their claims in, in a really positive and supportive and empathetic way. Because empathy and obviously sympathy are very different. Um, so we didn't want people saying, well, I've had that situation, that's occurred to me. Actually, you know, the customer doesn't want to hear that. The customer just wants to know what you're going to do for them to make it better for them. Okay. So then we moved on to, actually, when you put all of those things together, um, who are our new people? What do they look like? Sorry, I know they're not people. <laughs> they're profiles. Um, but, you know, um, this is about identifying, if we took two of the roles, you know, when we look at the profile, things like so in relationships, results and knowledge, where did that actually sit across the two? Now what you can see is there are quite a lot of similarities, particularly around strength of the relationships. Uh, so delighting customers, building effective relationships, communication was pretty much the same between both of the roles. And there wasn't a significant amount of difference generally. And I think you've got to remember the reason that that exists is because they're communicating with customers. 
So they're not communicating solely in an internal capacity, they're having to have an outward looking focus. Um, and the differences were really around the results orientated area. So you can see that for a claims handler, things like working effectively and planning um, were more important, even though they were equally important for our customer manager, but they were more important. So that's about how many claims have we got to process, when do they need to be processed by, what's our service level that we've committed to, to the employee, to the, not the employees, the customers, uh, but equally what we committed to, to our internal customers as well. So there was a very slight variation minuscule but that really mattered in terms of the type of assessment that we actually performed during the uh, during the selection process so even though it was very very tiny it did help us to distinguish in terms of the types of the selection processes that we actually used um, and I think you know from my experience having met these people so we had workshops where we had managers in the room who'd been there done the job people who did it well and equally people who didn't do it so well so you can imagine that conversation come along have you know tell us about your job and us discreetly trying to find out what it is that they did and how they did it and actually recognizing where they did poorly versus somebody who did brilliantly um, we had customers in feedback about what these people needed to do and how they needed to do it uh, we had the senior leadership team who actually, to be fair to someone like Adrian Brown, who's the CEO of the UK business, he'd worked his way up in the RSA. You know, he had been on the phones, he regularly went to the call centres, he knew what it was like to talk to a customer. So thankfully his feet were a little bit more firmly on the ground than maybe others, but it helped us to create something that was very relatable to the individuals doing the job, but also to the managers recruiting for their job. So in terms of the process, um, we wanted to make sure that we created some congruency um, in terms of the profiles and the, and the process. So again, this is not rocket science. You know, you guys probably do this all day, every day, and you have people who do it for you. But actually, it's the content that made it different. So the telephone screening that we had was a very clear set of questions that our internal recruitment team would ask and people would then get more time learning about the company and more time learning about the roles and actually being interviewed in terms of the first point. And at that point, the candidate could deselect themselves in exactly the same way that we could deselect them. So we had a dropout rate of somewhere between 20 to 30 percent, depending on the role, and that was because I identified that they were not suitable for that opportunity based on the questions and based on the information that we provided at front of the end of the process. So you can see already we're narrowing our pool of people based on the qualities, the values, the intellect, the things that are driving this profile to make sure that every step we take we're increasing our chances of success. Then we had a motivation test, so we made sure that their career anchors were aligned to us um, and that was again a part of the step of the process where they could deselect themselves. Um, and then we had the assessments. So I did bring some things along if people wanted to have a look at them, um, but we did real play assessments. So as opposed to having this wonderful fabricated situation, we reduced our assessments from four hours to an hour and a half. In that hour and a half we had three particular things. We had an interview, which was a competency-based interview based on the competencies for the role and the profiles that we talked about. We had a proper assessment where we had real life scenarios that were actually in play, not to say on that day, but sometime in the weeks previous to that where they had to deal with the scenario. And then we had um, a, um, the, the follow-up for the career anchor questionnaire. But what was really interesting, and I don't know how many organisations do this, and I'm not suggesting that RSA are alone in this, but if, for example, somebody came to do an assessment but did really badly in the interview, if we were able to give them some feedback and we genuinely felt, as a manager or as a HR person, that we could inspire them to take on board the feedback and change, and then we'd invite them back for another conversation, and if they showed they had the propensity to change, it was then a judgment decision of the manager whether they wanted to take that person on board. And actually, that really empowered our managers. Because we weren't saying, OK, you've got to score 31 out of 35 to pass. And if you score 30, then you failed. Because actually, we all know we don't do brilliantly at stuff. You know, my mum, God bless her, used to say to me, oh, just do your best at school, you know, do your best at exams. It wasn't until I did my MBA that I realised that I was probably better at exams than I thought I was when I was younger. Um, but actually, I was better at the practical things. So if I went into an assessment, for example, I'd probably do better at the real plays and the scenarios and the interviews rather than, say, a numerical verbal reasoning test 
um, which I, shamefully say I probably would do very badly. Um, so it was about giving somebody who had the propensity to change the opportunity to do that. And also it's about empowering managers to be able to see that within somebody and make that decision. And actually, to be honest with you, that was the biggest amount of change in terms of changing the culture of our managers and the way that we recruited. Um, and they did go through proper um, training and development before they could actually run this process themselves. And then we had the hiring and onboarding process. So what was really interesting is from this stage, we took, and again, I think we were talking about this earlier, Susie, uh, we took all the feedback and created a proper personalised onboarding induction process for them. So not only have we personalised the profile, we've got under the skin of who the type of personnel that needs to do these types of jobs, we have created questions and assessments and tools to be able to make sure that they're aligned to the role so that when they come through they feel like this is a job they really, really want, this is the organisation they really, really want to work for. We've actually said to them, we've listened to you, we've seen you, and we're going to help you get the best possible start within Royal Sun Alliance. And that's where they had a candidate pack, which is an onboarding piece, which had clear objectives about their ability, um, whether it be good in terms of their strengths and things that we needed to do differently in terms of their future. And that really helped to then put them in the right team that would then, and we did start to see this, um, shift that culture of that team from being one of probably quite mundane to one that's slightly more motivated and more engaged. So the onboarding process, um, as I've talked about, had a candidate pack, we had very strong employee inductions, um, we had online modules for people, um, so this is really the back end of I suppose the personalising, but it made people feel, because the feedback was that it felt they, they were more than just a number to RSA, that they felt like they were an individual that mattered to them. Um, and you know, from our perspective, it just cemented, solidified, embedded the fact that we really wanted that person to join our business. Now, I thought a lot about this, and um, Mila said to me, oh, you've left your last slide blank, Rachel, because we were talking on the phone about reflections. Now, there's no way that, you know, that was a perfect example of how to personalise recruitment. I mean, yeah, we didn't use Facebook, we didn't use any form of social media, um, we didn't use advertising in the way that we, we do now. You know, I mean, there are so many different ways to do this now. And actually, that's my reflection, because my challenge to myself was to think about what we could have done differently. Um, and I think if, if you were to do this type of thing, you have so many more tools available to you to understand who your audience is, to connect them with your brand, to connect them with your customer, to ensure that you're targeting them through your advertising and marketing campaigns in the right way, that you're creating the right look around your profiles and you're giving real life stories. You know, if I go into the Reward Gateway website, you know, there people talk about what it's like to work at Reward Gateway and how great it is and, you know, what it's actually like on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's, I think there's that greater connection that you can have from the beginning of trying to get into people into your organisation um, and you can use that to help formulate um, a more personalised approach to, to the recruitment process. So we delivered some great things, um, and I could talk about it forever. Um, and um, you know, I would say that it has significantly, from what I understand, obviously not working there anymore, but it has significantly shifted the culture, the performance, and the reputation of the more than brand um, out in the insurance marketplace for RSA. And that's it.